Hear that? That's the sweet sound of Minute Maid slushies at McDonald's. Turning up your summer with every sip, slurp, and ah. Get a small sweet peach, blue raspberry, or fruit punch slushie for just $2. Or get any size soft drink for $1. Price participation may vary. Limited time only cannot be combined with combo meal. Say Metro by T-Mobile. Got the best deal in wireless. And it's all for you. All for me. Just switch quickly. Because Metro has two lines for 80. And two Samsung Galaxy J7 Star phones for free. Plus Amazon Prime included. That's the way wireless should be. Only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. $50 plus rate plan required. Not valid for numbers currently on T-Mobile Network or on Metro in past 90 days. Offer subject to change. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Amazon Prime has a $12.99 per month value. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 342. The more that you take distribution into your own hands, the better chance you will have to actually making any money at all. Mongo Wilder. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Music Bed. As filmmakers, we're always looking for songs and music for our projects, but it's such a pain in the butt to license and go get music, and it's just been a nightmare. But Musicbed has changed all of that. You can download a single song, get unlimited music with a subscription, or even create a custom song or score from scratch. They already have over 20,000 songs, beautifully categorized, and their catalog is growing every single day. If you want to check it out, just go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Musicbed. And because you are Indie Film Hustle Tribe members, you get one month for free to try it out or 20% off a single song purchase. Just enter the promo code Indie Film Hustle. Today's show is also sponsored by Blackmagic's new Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. I am super, super jazzed about this camera. It is a Super 35 sensor and has 13 stops of dynamic range, an EF lens mount, and dual native ISO up to 25,600 for incredible low light performance. It features Blackmagic RAW, a large 5 inch touchscreen built-in CFast and SD card readers, and USB-C expansion port to record directly to an external disc. This is an insane camera, guys, and it is a game changer. Oh, and by the way, you also get a copy of DaVinci Resolve Studio to edit, color, do sound for all of your films. If you're going to make a low-budget independent film, this camera is the one for you. It's the one I highly, highly recommend. The camera is running at a ridiculous $24.95. That's it. For more information, please head over to Blackmagic's website at www.blackmagicdesign.com. Now, today, guys, is an episode, it is a crossover event with Film Entrepreneurs Podcast because this is arguably one of the more important podcasts I've done in quite some time. This guest is going to hopefully save a lot of filmmakers a lot of pain. Today's guest is Naomi McDougal Jones, and she is one of the filmmakers behind the independent film Bite Me, which is a subversive romantic comedy about real-life vampires and the IRS agent that audits them. Now, what's incredible about this story is what they did and how they went about trying to make their half a million dollar budget back. Now, they have no bankable stars in the movie, so there was going to be a little bit of an uphill battle to be able to recoup that money. And then when they went down the road of trying to find a a distributor, they were just so disheartened by the horror stories and how the system is literally rigged with most distributors, not all, but most distributors. And that whole model, that whole legacy model of, of traditional distribution is kind of set up to screw the filmmaker. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. There are really, really good distributors out there like Indie Rights, which I highly, highly recommend. And there's a couple other ones, but generally speaking, every distribution company I've dealt with other than a handful have been just horrible, 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 horrible. And Naomi really wanted to kind of do something interesting. So they literally went on a tour around the country 
and they called it the Joyful Vampire Tour of America, where they rented an RV, put some fangs on it, and went around to city after city like a carnival and, and, and showed their films and sold their wares, sold their ancillary products, made money with their movie, and were in complete control of the revenue coming in. And their bravery of what they were trying to do and this entire crazy journey was documented in this must-see, I repeat, must-see documentary series called The Joyful Vampire Tour of America, where they literally, as if I may quote her, they pull their pants down and show the good, the bad, and the ugly of everything. They're completely transparent with all of their numbers. If they screw up, they let you know. If they make money, they let you know what they could have done better, what could they have done worse. They interview other other filmmakers and their processes in the, in the series. It is an amazing must-see series for anybody wanting to make a movie in today's world, and specifically if you're going to try to self-distribute your film. A lot of the things that we talk about in distribution, you know, even six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago, is obsolete now. It Everything changes so rapidly. You know why? Because the industry is trying to figure it out. Everything is changing so quickly. The, the consumer's changing so quickly. Everything is changing so quickly. We got to try to figure out ways for independent filmmakers to actually make money. And Naomi was wonderful. She's a wonderful guest. She completely is transparent with everything and drops knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb with also a few inspiration bombs as well. So I'm not going to talk anymore without any further ado. Please enjoy my conversation with Naomi McDougal Jones. I'd like to welcome to the show, Naomi McDougal Jones. How are you doing? Thank, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it. You guys reached out to me and I heard about your craziness and I said, <laughs> I need to, I mean, it, you're, you're insane and I love it. And anytime I meet insane filmmakers who are good and because there's crazy insane, which is just yeah. like, I've lost my mind. I'm an egomaniac and we've met those filmmakers, Yes, but, but you were, you're a good kind of insane, something ambitious. <laughs> you have audacity. I love that. Yeah. You had an audacity. I'm like, we're going to do this. Watch. So I, I, I felt it was a perfect uh, story for a film entrepreneur. And because you are a film entrepreneur without question, you are yes. uh, a, a, a definition of film entrepreneurship without question. So before we get going, I want to know uh, tell me a little bit about your film, Bite Me, and, uh, sure. and how it came to life. Because we're going to talk a lot about this film. Sure. So uh, Bite Me is my second feature film. I wrote it. I was one of the producers and I star in it. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a subversive comedy about a real life vampire and IRS agent who audits her. Now, when you say real life vampire, it's like someone who identifies as a vampire? Yes. So there is a real global community of people of who identify as vampires in real life. Well, you say, of course, but not everybody knows this. I mean, I mean, I'm hip. You're very hip. You're I'm hip very hip it. that way. Yes. Yeah. I've seen, Cause when you say vampires, like, cause people might think is like, is this like interview with a vampire? I'm like, no, this is yeah, not, yeah. it's like, no, these no, are no. people this who are real, who are in the lore. I mean, I, 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 I had a lot of goth friends in high school, so I, I am aware yes. of this. <laughs> so, so, so some portion of that community believes that they need to drink human blood to stay healthy. And they do through donors. Through donors. Uh, so, so the genesis of the film was wanting to I, to write a really great romantic comedy. I love romantic comedies. I'm mm-hmm. really sad that the genre has taken such a horrible nosedive. No, well, ever since Nora Ephron left us. Yeah, uh, I know. She well, was so wonderful. Like the early oh. 2000s. It's just been terrible. It's been pretty. So rough. anyway, so I, so I was trying to figure out like how do you how do you make something smart and edgy and well written and feminist and just like a well made movie that is also a romantic comedy. And, uh, I, I found out about this vampire community and those two ideas kind of smashed together. And well, well I mean, I heard this st- oh, yeah. when I heard, when I saw the trailer, I'm like, well, this is genius. Like, <laughs> and the reason there's the IRS agent is, I, is because they are trying to identify as a nonprofit because of their religion or well, how does yes. that work? So, so they, so vampires would tell you that, that vampirism is not a religion. It's, it's a fact of their lives. Sure. It's an identity. Um, but the vampires in the film have registered as a church basically for tax reasons. Um, (laughs) right. 
possibly to scam the government slightly. What? Um, so they get audited at the beginning of the film, and that sort of sets the whole story in motion. I mean, seriously, that just alone is hilarious. <laughs> I mean, just that concept is it's a very high concept yeah. um, film, which is great. Yeah. Now, the the other thing that I found interesting about this is that you guys uh, you guys raised a lot of money for this yeah. film. I mean, I mean, I know it's considered in the in the world of studios a low budget, you know, uh, argue some of them would even argue to say it's a micro budget. I wouldn't call this a micro budget, sure. but it's a low yeah. budget film. Um, the budget from what I've read is half a million, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. That is a lot of money for a yeah. for a romantic comedy with no marketable quote unquote uh, actors in it. So how first of all, yeah. how did you raise the money for this kind of project? And then we'll talk about how we're gonna get the money back. Okay. <laughs> um yeah, well, so I, I made my first feature film, Imagine I'm Beautiful, on a true micro budget scale for eighty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. And that we had crowdfunded most of that and then kind of cobbled the rest of it together through some sm small investments. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we made the film and it won a bunch of awards on the festival circuit. That film actually even got a traditional theatrical distribution deal. But we, but it like, and there are some, there are things I love about true micro budget filmmaking, but we wanted a bigger <laughs> Yeah, well, fair you enough. Wanna, you want to eat? Bigger, I get it. You want yeah, some time and to be play. Able to pay ourselves and people and and things like that. Bigger toys um, to play with. Got it. Yeah. Um, so we and we felt like having demonstrated that we could do that with eighty thousand, that we could go out and raise the the half a million, which we did over a, th a three year period. It took us three years Oof. to raise the money. Yeah. Um, which is, as you as from the face you're Ooh. making, you know, it's brutal. Well, yeah, um, because how many, how many filmmakers do you know are still looking for that money to drop any day now oh, that yeah. investor is going to drop that money totally. and, and, and well, you look and you look at the clock and you're like, oh, wow, five years have gone. Oh, totally. And, and, and it's brutal because during that period of time, there's no guarantee that it will work. Right. Cause you also mm -hmm. know that, right. There are the filmmakers were like 20 years into this and never have found the money. And a the week, only a, a thing, day before, a day before the money will, right. just, will go away. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. right. So, um, so it's just sort of like this sheer willpower of yourself and your team to keep going and the belief that this will eventually work out. Um, but so we did raise, uh, we used the New York t t tax credit. So we took out a loan against the 25% New York tax credit towards okay. financing the movie and the other 75% we raised through equity investments from private investors. Um, we raised it from around 20 investors. So, okay. um, it was a, it was a matter of cobbling together smaller investment amounts. Okay. So that makes, that makes sense. And the tax credits are a huge deal, uh, especially, um, I had another New York filmmaker on the other day and uh, they they were saying there. I hear New York is a wonderful place to shoot. I hear they're just super open and you know. And now I think it's like three hundred bucks. He told me that for all permits, like you could shoot. Yeah, the permit, anywhere. I know, but everyone assumes it'll be really. Ex everyone always thinks it's really expensive to shoot outside in New York, and it's actually the cheapest place you can shoot. And has the most production value. Yeah, and they're yeah, yeah. Re they're really open because everyone here at LA. I mean, you even. You can't. You need a permit to shoot in your house. What? You. I mean, technically, you need a permit to shoot in a house. If someone calls you, like if you're shooting a little movie in your house, and if some, if the neighbor doesn't like it and calls the cops, you will be ticketed and you will have to go to court and pay a fine. Oh, it's in, well that's because crazy. because we're in L.A., so <laughs> that's why you assume all big cities are like that, and and they're yeah. not. L.A. is. L.A. is murderous. To Although. Shoot it. Funny thing, so we have a scene that takes place in Central Park, and, yeah. and what we learned about Central Park is that you don't have to pay extra for the permit. However, you do have to convince the people in charge to let you shoot in Central Park, and and they've segmented right. Central Park into a series of tiny little fiefdoms. So even if you're shooting in a really <laughs> relatively fiefdoms, small area, it. you have to go convince like five p different people to let you shoot on their patch of Central Park. It's just basically like like lords, lords yeah, yeah. of of the manor, if you will, <laughs> yes. like little like fiefdoms, like little fiefdoms, yeah, like yeah. you were saying, little yeah, yeah. lords that you have to convince. Oh, so, so Lord, can we shoot on your grass? Right. Um, it's free, but we just like you know. Yeah, yeah, but we need your blessing, so please, wow. maybe. Wow, that's that's super weird. Yeah. Um, 
That's hilarious. That's actually hilarious. Um, okay, so you're shooting in New York. Uh, you're shooting this movie. Now, did, I had to ask you a question. Did you at ever consider uh, trying to cast a more marketable name uh, or, a, or a more marketable, traditionally marketable name in some sort of parts which would make it easier to sell hmm. uh, well, a film of this budget range? I'm just curious. We did. I mean, I think realistically – for half a million dollars, unless you're friends with that person, it's it's virtually impossible to get bigger actors than we got. Okay. I think we certainly had ambitions to do that. And I feel like there you always hear these stories of like people getting so and so for this tiny film. And I, I feel like underneath those stories, they're almost always a relationship or related to those people before. <laughs> because yeah. because the problem, of course, is not the actors, it's the agents. And so Ooh, yeah. like of course, we put offers out to to bigger people, but I'm almost certain that their agents never gave it to them because why would they don't want Daniel Radcliffe doing this film when Marvel might call at any moment and pay them seventeen times the cost right the fee, and you know? like, and if you're and if you're offering him let's say fifty thousand dollars for a day um the the agent's gonna pull in a little bit of money of off that they rather pull in off the millions right. and, and stuff exactly. like that right. and they, that's something and that's something that independent filmmakers even listening to this or watching this are are, are not aware of this like agents you th- there's so many um guards or uh gatekeepers to some of these actors so like with my first film I had an insane cast, but they were all friends right. of ours. And they were all right. like, they like, oh, I'll come out. I'm in LA. Yeah, I'll come out for the day. Yeah. And right. and these are people who have been in big, huge movies and and but they were all friends. So it, it right. really does that, help. It makes all the difference. Because so I'll tell you a really crazy story. So our cast, as we'll probably talk about in a moment, are not like A-list actors, but are our, our name T- actors in a sense. Like they've been on stuff. Their faces, they're the recognized. So one of those actors we were, I had actually written the part in the film specifically for, and we reached out to her, we, through our casting director, we submitted an offer to her agent and, and I had actually written a personal letter explaining this, um, that with the offer and we hadn't heard anything. And I was like, this agent is not, has not given her this offer. I just had this feeling. And so we had a mutual friend and I asked the friend if she would just be willing to forward my letter to this actress, um, just to make sure she'd gotten it. And within about half an hour, this actress called me and was like, of course I want to do this movie. Nobody's ever written a part for me before. Like, <laughs> insane. And her agent had not given her the offer and she had to call her agent and be like, Hey, what's up? What is going on? And they were like, Oh, um, Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. And then they were incredibly obstructionist, like the whole time trying oh, to make oh, a deal with her. Oh, oh, absolutely. There's, yeah. there's, there's two quick, quick acting stories. One, uh, that same thing happened. Quentin Tarantino, when he was doing Pulp Fiction, uh, submitted for James Woods and James Woods agent didn't give it to him. And then after the movie came out, James Woods we met Quentin and Quentin's like, yeah, I sent it to you. I'm like, what? And his agent never gave it to him. Yeah. And he was pissed. Sure. And there was another story of, of some filmmakers who, uh, this great story. They actually uh, went to a film festival and Ed Harris was speaking. After the, the talk, they bum rushed the stage, jumped on the stage, and they had a DVD player, portable DVD, this a while ago, DVD player, and showed them – Showed him the the trailer for his for their film that they they were like like you know like a sizzle reel that they had yeah, shot, yeah. and they literally went into the back. He's like, "Come follow me," and he went into the back alley to smoke, and uh, they told him his whole story that I want you to play the part because you're, you're you would be playing our alcoholic father father and all this, and Ed, Ed Ed Harris said, "Yeah, I'll do it," and I mean, and Ed Harris, if you remember, has doesn't do independent films. Like he's, right. he's one of those actors. He never did it, but he said he was going to do it. Everyone at CAA was just trying to torpedo that left and right. And it was Ed that said, sure, I'm doing this guys. So make it happen. So yeah. unless you're able to get direct access to some of these right. actors, it's, it's extremely no, it's difficult. Im- it's impossible. Well, because the agents are directly disincentivized from allowing that to happen. Did you know, have you heard about Bill Murray's hotline? No. 
I, okay, please tell me amazing. about please okay. tell me about Bill Murray's hotline. Oh, please, oh, please. So Bill Murray does not have an agent and refuses to have an agent for this reason. So Bill Murray has a hotline number that you can call, that anybody can call and leave a message pitching their project. No. And then he, then from there, so so I read this story once written by a filmmaker who had eventually gotten Bill Murray to be in his movie this way. And he said, so he called the hotline and he left a message with the pitch. And then like three months later, gets a call from Bill Murray being like, can you meet me in LA for lunch tomorrow? And the guy was like, like, no, I can't. I'm so sorry. Like I'm in New York. And, he, and Bill Murray hangs up the phone, click. And the guy is like, no, <laughs> what? And then, and then three months after that, Bill Murray calls him again and he says, can you be in, can I pick you up at LAX in like 12 hours? And the guy was like, sure. Yes. Yeah, yes. And so he gets in an airplane, goes to LAX, oh Bill Murray picks him up in a, in the back of a limousine, oh my, they just... drive around for like three hours oh or the my... driver drives around for three oh. hours. They talk about the movie. Bill Murray says that he'll do the movie. And then they drive him back to LAX to drop him off. And the guy is like, like, can you just like write on a napkin or something that you agreed to do? Like, I have no proof that this happened. Nobody's ever going to believe that this happened. Right. And, uh, what did Bill do? I don't think he wrote it down, but he did do the movie eventually. Wow. That's <laughs> amazing. But you have to, but how do you get this number? I'm not going to promote it, but I'm just curious. How do you No, I think number? you can Google it. Like, I think it's, I think it's just it's a thing. It's just yeah. a thing. Yeah. I love Bill Murray. I just absolutely <laughs> I know. love Bill Murray. He is like yeah. the coolest human being. Like the coolest. I mean, amazing. Okay. So, so did you call Bill Murray? You should have called no, him to pitch this. There wasn't, there wasn't a role for him. You know? <laughs> he could have played the female vampire. He would have <laughs> so done it. <laughs> Um, all right, so you you you've raised half a million dollars uh, to make this romantic comedy about vampires. Now, when you were doing this, did you have a niche audience in in mind? Did you figure out like, okay, we are going to target this group of people? Because I'm assuming the the vampire community itself is a the people who identify as vampires is fairly small comparatively to the general public, but people who like vampires is a fairly large yeah. niche audience. And then there's yeah. horror and there's horror fans and people that actually it, it could spill over to. Was yeah. that, was that a thought process? Oh, very much. And actually circling back to the casting conversation that we were very intentional about how we cast based on the audience, even though we, we weren't able to get bigger actors. Um, so our, our working hypothesis was that our, our audience was going to break down into two groups one, we lovingly term the mega nerds. Hey. So like people who, uh, which I, which I, I mean, I have a life size, I have a life size Yoda yeah. behind me. So <laughs> I just, yes. I just clocked that. <laughs> um, it's a safe so, space. It's just a safe space. Yeah, yeah. Safe space. <laughs> so people who play D and D people who are LARPers, people who are mega sci-fi comic, fans, comic con, um, comic con, guys. comic con, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, f- with the vampire angle. Mm-hmm. And then secondarily, uh, people who love romantic comedies. Mm -hmm. Um, but we figured that, that we needed to be a little bit more specific with that group. So we, we figured people who love romantic comedies and also Harry Potter because, Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the film is very much about sort of the feeling of being an outsider and wanting to be seen and accepted. And so we felt like the people who were at the convergence of, that we're, we're going to be the right people. Interesting. So that was just a, a, a demographic, I'm assuming in like direct ads and things like that is what you're talking about to target so these we, people. We, right. So we, we didn't test that at the time we tested it before we released the film and it did tr- prove to be correct. Um, but I am a person who likes romantic comedies and Harry Potter quite strongly both. And so we figured that that was a pretty good cipher. Mega nerd. Uh, got it. Me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and, and also the film has an almost entirely female creative team at the, the lead character is a, is a super badass edgy female character. And so we figured also we, we wanted to go after people who liked that kind of edgy femi- feminist content. Now, how did you target them through like Facebook ads and things like that? Through Facebook. Yeah. So when we eventually released the film, we had a, a number of, of marketing, um, tactics. So, so we did do the Facebook ads direct, okay. uh, 
And then all, and we, we had slightly different messaging that we marketed the film as to those two groups. So like for the mega nerds, we pushed the vampire angle more strongly. And for the rom-com people, we pushed the love stories angle more strongly. Interesting. And that actually, uh, cause I've, I mean, I always preach and, you know, as a film entrepreneur, you're like, you have to niche down, niche down, niche down mm-hmm. and understand who your audience is. So I'm, I find it interesting, like, because if you're gonna try to, uh, uh, if you're gonna try to reach romantic comedy lovers, that's too large of a an audience. You right. you don't have the resources to, to do right. that. But when you combine the Harry Potter romantic comedy area, it niches it down. Mm-hmm. But it's not a niche that you would conceive normally. It's like, and that's an interesting concept. I've really never thought of it that way. We're like, okay, well. People who like romantic comedies and also like Harry Potter's are probably going to like this. Let's do a test. Let's do a Mm -hmm. test uh, ad, which you could do for 25, 35 bucks, 50 bucks, and just kind of just test out your hypothesis. And it was interesting. So we we tested way at the beginning of of the putting together the marketing materials. We we did A-B test those two different demographic groups with our trailer. Mm -hmm. And we had exactly the same click through rate from both groups, which was really interesting because we thought maybe we'd, we'd learn that one was stronger than the other and then target the film that way. And it actually came out totally evenly. Really? That's interesting. So that's yeah. a good way for people listening is, well, you did market research prior to like, you were trying to figure out how to do this by, by doing these kind of like little test Facebook ads and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So you're basically doing a lot of the stuff that I preach, which is fantastic. Uh, and why you're on the show. Um, all right. So, all right. So you had a very, so, so you had a, so, so just to, to close the loop on the casting thing quickly. Um, so because we, we had the feeling that that was who our audience is, we then decided that it was important to get actors that, that had fan following specifically in those groups of people. So smart. That aren't necessarily household names, but would be known to those people. So we, we really wanted a Harry Potter actor very much. And we ended up getting Christian Coulson, who played Tom Riddle and Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets. Um, and then we got Naomi Grossman from American Horror Story. Perfect. And then Annie Golden from Orange is the New Black, which we figured she's great. edgy feminist yeah. content. I mean, she's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we tried to think about casting that. So, so that is, again what we preach and it is it is so wonderful to see this because you know look if you made this movie for 50 grand you have less to risk but you have half a million dollars which is a substantial amount of money for an independent film Mm -hmm. uh and you're being very smart so far in this journey i'm seeing it you're you're (laughs) being very smart and strategic on how you're doing this because again i've always said like if you're going to make a horror movie you might not be able to afford Brad Pitt, but you might be able to afford Robert England to come out for a day or two, right. who has a huge okay. horror following. And if you're doing something that's aimed at 80s horror, I mean, he's a dude that you would probably right. want to, to cast and probably affordable comparatively, you know, right. to, you know, obviously you can't get Brad Pitt or Meryl Streep or something like that. Right. Um, but they actually are larger in the niche that you're trying exactly. to. Exactly. It's who are, so we had, <laughs> we had two young women we premiered at Cinequest in San Jose, California. Yeah, so did, Two, I, yeah. did you? Yeah, my yeah my first film was was oh, premiered awesome. at Cinequest. They're awesome. I loved, I loved Cinequest. So we we had that premiere. Um, we had two young women drive thirty hours from Michigan to San Jose for that premiere because Christian Coulson tweeted about it, and then later they moved to North Carolina before we had a Brooklyn screening where. Christian Coles was going to be there. And they drove another 20 hours from North Carolina to be at that screening and meet Christian Colson. Like that is the kind of fan that you want. Yeah. 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 That's the kind of fans <laughs> you want. And you, and in all honesty, you can't do a film like this without that kind of strategy. Like yeah. it's like, if you just like grab, you know, grab a whole bunch of friends uh, or, or, or no name actors or, or non-recognizable, non-marketable actors and try to do half a million dollars, which I've seen multiple times. It'll die on the vine. It just won't go there. So you have to. Do, this is like right. you need you need something. You need some that's angle gonna, that's going to turn out the people. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So you finish making this movie. Now I'm assuming during this process, even during the making of this pro- movie or prior to it, you're already thinking how you're going to distribute this thing, correct? Yeah, we were. Although to be perfectly honest, um, so my first feature film, as I said, had gotten a distribution deal. Mm-hmm. which at the uh, time f- felt like, oh my God, and it was a theatrical, it was 10 city theatrical. And, I'm sure, and, I'm, and you're still counting the money that they keep sending you, right? Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I mean, it so, must be tiring to to, yeah, to yeah, yeah. swim in the gold coins like Scrooge McDuck. It yeah. must be rough. So I will tell you exactly what happened with that movie. So we got a distributor, and and I and we actually, I believe our distributor were wasn't were honest people, which I think mm-hmm. in and of itself is incredibly rare and lucky. Shock. Um, yeah. But we we have made to date came out in 2014, slightly less than five thousand dollars we have received from that. From the whole and movie, from everything. From everything. Jesus. And to and to make matters worse, a year ago that company folded and got their their titles got bought by another distribution company, mm. which happens all of the time because these mm-hmm. distribution companies are turning over like that. And um, that company has had our film since last August, so a full year, yeah. and yeah. we have not received a single report or check from them. Period. Despite the fact that we have emailed and called them multiple, multiple times, we had a lawyer contact them. Like they just won't. Unless come back to us. they're like, if you want it, sue us. Yeah. Basically, right. wh- when is the original contract up? In one year. Okay, and then it'll come back to you, and then you yeah. can do whatever you want with it. Right. So thank God it was a short. I mean, it was it was a six year contract, which is relatively which is, short. It's relatively short. Anywhere between five to seven is where I recommend. Which is yeah. not recommend, but it's just generally. You know, I literally right. just got a call from a filmmaker. He's like, yeah, this uh, distribution company will not be named, uh, but they offered a 15-year. Yeah. 15-year oh, right. deal with no money up front. With no money up front. So I'm like, yeah. oh, you're donating the film then. You're, you're, it's yeah, a donation. Yeah. It's a donation. Right. Right. So there's a write-off. It's a write-off because right. you're never going to see a dime. Oh, and 100,000 uh, p and Locked off at 100,000 p and mm-hmm. So I tell like, are yep. you kidding? Are you kidding? You'll yep. never see a dime yep. ever. It's yep. predatory. These guys are predatory. It's, it's, it's so disgusting. So we made, a, we made a docu-series about the tour, which yeah. we, we'll talk about in a, in a while. But, yeah. um, but in the course of part of that docu-series was that we wanted to be radically transparent about our data and mm-hmm. numbers and revenue and everything because we feel like a huge problem in this space is that nobody has any information. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we're essentially all making dumb decisions because we don't know it, have any information. Mm-hmm. So because we'd done that, a number of other filmmakers began reaching out to us who had gotten to tr- traditional distribution deals and were, were willing to disclose to us what had happened um, numbers wise. So, so we had a, a pair of filmmakers come on our, sh- on our series and talk about what happened and it it was the the abuse the, the beating the beating yes well and and like the thievery oh and, it's straight up and so then we had a lawyer contact us who who spends a lot of time fighting this stuff and he said i mean <laughs> the whole phone calls in the episode it and I, i'm and i'm crying by the end of the phone call because it's so horrifying what he told us wow i would like to talk to him <laughs> you should totally talk to him. I will. Me, we, I'll we, put you in we, touch with him. We will yeah. talk after afterwards yeah. because I I really need to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, I've talked about distribution and and you know the whole film entrepreneur model in general is about giving power, to thinking about film as an entrepreneurial endeavor, thinking of your movie as a product and audiences and selling it and, and all that stuff, and to use traditional um, distribution as a partnership or as a hybrid part of uh, part of the mm-hmm. hybrid distribution model where you still retain some sort of control uh, right. and you don't get lost. You know, I know Sundance winners with their movies that, that got lost in bankruptcies oh, yeah. of distribution companies and oh, yeah. their rights are locked up for years. And by the time six years rolls around, no one cares about their Sundance winner movie right. anymore. Right. It's Well, one of the filmmakers who came on our series to talk was, uh, they didn't win Sundance, but they were at Sundance, which is, you know, like Enough. winning. It's a win- that's winning. That's winning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And they have received zero dollars back from their distribution company so far. I mean, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's insane. Okay, so so you you um we're, we're gonna get about the docuseries in a little bit. So you, your distribution plan, what was the idea like when you started going down this? Because I'm assuming you feel responsible to pay back these people. Uh yeah. and 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 even possibly make a little money on this mm-hmm. on this deal. So you, as a responsible filmmaker, were like, "Okay, guys, we've got half a million. How are we going to make this back?" Mm-hmm. What was the What was the thought process there? Yeah. So initially, we started going down the same old path 
of applying to film festivals and wanting to be picked like Cinderella out of the masses and sort of like (laughs) the lottery ticket, the lottery ticket mentality, the lottery ticket. Um, and it's really two lottery tickets, right? You have to win the lottery of the film festivals to get into a major film festival where you can even be looked at by seriously by distributors. And And then you have to win the lottery again to actually get a distribution deal. Yeah. So basically, and there's only what, five, six, seven in in the U S five, there's five five that matter. Yep. Absolutely. And even then, even Sundance. So I had I had a, a distribute somebody who's worked deeply in distribution tell me the other day off the record that um, she said, you know, all these distribution companies tell filmmakers, don't worry if you don't get into one of the top film festivals. We still look at other festivals, whatever. She's like, that is bullshit. She's like, if the reality is, if you don't get into a top film festival, you are screwed. If you get into a top film festival, you are still probably screwed, but there is a tiny percentage of chance that you're not totally screwed. Unless you go at it from a different point of view, like you are and yes, what we exactly. talk about. Okay. Right. So, all right. So, so what was the, so, all right, so you went down the ba- okay. the normal traditional path we, of trying so, Sundance, you submitted to Sundance. You submitted, submitted to Sundance. You were not accepted to Sundance. <laughs> it's not really a Sundance kind of movie. It's, I mean, but also, but uh, you, you, you did a uh, crowdfund with Seed and Spark, right? We did, yeah. Okay, so uh, can we talk just quickly about you know because sure. I crowdfunded my first film on Seed and yeah, Spark, yeah. and I love Emily and I love what they're oh, doing. They're fan- the greatest. They're fantastic, yeah. and uh, you know, did you so you crowdfunded this? How much did you raise when you crowdfunded? We crowdfunded thirty five thousand. So that's a, that's a that's a good amount. Yeah, that's a good yeah, yeah. amount without question. Amount. And then you and then you, you got the investments for the rest. Mm-hmm. But you started to build an audience with them. Yeah. With, with Seed and Spark. And then Seed and Spark has their own kind of, you know, distribution output deal, like through yes. their service and right. they have a deal with, uh, with Quiver and all that kind of stuff, right? They don't have a deal with Quiver. We, Anymore? we got to Quiver, um, uh, Liz Manischel at Sundance. Oh, of course, Liz. Yeah. She's a friend of the show. Um, <laughs> we had, um, we had gotten to the final rounds of being selected for their creative distribution lab and they have a deal with Quiver that if, you're a finalist. You got a discount. Awesome. So that's yeah. how we they were on the show. They were on the show. Did, did you, um, the funny, a, a quick funny story about Liz. She called me and she's like, Alex, we have this distribution grant. We want to give people filmmakers away, but we have like 15 people who've signed up. I need help. Can you get the word out? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, are you kidding? Are you kidding me? Give me a minute. And then I, yeah. and, and then I put her on the show and <laughs> I go, be careful what you wish for. And yeah. they were inundated. They had to <laughs> shut it down. And I said, and they were foolish enough to leave their emails on the show. I'm like, don't. Oh, no. She's like, no, no, we don't mind. We want to help. I'm like, okay. And like, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was, it was brutal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So you went down that road. So, so, uh, so go ahead, continue. Okay. So we, I would say we spent about, from like September to, to you no, know, to like Thanksgiving, sort of going down that path, having initial conversations with distributors and sales agents and simultaneously sort of feeling our own souls dying by the, by the just like sort of soulless horribleness of that process. Mm-hmm. And also, um, so I had had that experience with my, my first feature film and my producing partner, Sarah Wharton's past feature films that had very similar experiences with, with traditional distributors. And like, we were just kind of getting like, it just began to feel like we were going to hand our film to a person who was going to throw it off a cliff again in exchange for a large percentage of our revenues. Like it it's just, a, you throw it up it, against the wall and see what sticks. Right. And also I think what was different this time too is, is at this current moment in film distribution, you can feel the despondency wafting off of the distributors themselves. Like you're in these conversations and they're just like, well, we don't know what works. I love your movie and I have absolutely no idea how to sell it. <laughs> like, you can just feel the despair. But I, think, like but, I, but I think also distributors have uh, the same problem as independent filmmakers. It's oh, like yeah. they – 
they can't get above the noise. Like no, no, there, right. there's, there's certain bigger distributors. I mean, I'm not even talking about Lionsgate or the studios or anything like sure. that. I'm talking about just like even bigger indie distributors names. These guys, they just basically pump it out through their outlets. So they'll put it on iTunes, Amazon. Yeah. They might make a red box deal if you're lucky. Um, yeah. they, maybe they'll do a limited theatrical if it has some sort of maybe – uh, the, if it maybe they'll get Netflix or Hulu to buy it, they'll they'll submit it. But they just basically shotgun it. They don't yeah. really have a a plan, and it's almost impossible for a distributor without major money to distribute uh, to to get any sort of awareness for a film. Even if no. you dump five or ten million bucks into P and A, that still means that's nothing. Totally, and and yeah, there is no doubt that we are in a profound distribution crisis right now across the board. Like it's not, it's not, it's not like it's the distributors, not that piece of it is not the distributor's fault. But, but in that landscape, I feel like it makes the prospect of going with a distributor even worse because like, like they're just like flinging stuff out Mm -hmm. and nothing's working. Because right it's now. it's too it, it it they they've caught they they're basically I hate to use the term blockbuster but then don't be blockbuster that's what that is they got into they got fat this is the way it's right. always been and then when right. Netflix totally. sh- and when Netflix showed up and offered blockbuster to buy them for fifty million and blockbuster said no kid we're fine we're good on this video store thing we don't need. <laughs> Your yep. DVD home sale thing, whatever you're doing, and but that's what that's where these old school distribution distribution companies right. are coming from. They're just they have no idea how to handle the new landscape, and it's changing right. daily, daily, daily. It's insane. Yeah, insane. Right. So, um, so in the middle of that mess, there there came a moment around Thanksgiving where we were just like we just looked at each other and we were like, we're not doing this again. This is horrible and not going to work. Um, and this movie is too good. We have too much money on the line. We're just not, nope, we're not doing it. So we started, I, I had a dream actually, (laughs) really is what happened. Yes. I'm okay. Yes. I had a dream (laughs) that, uh, we were driving around the country in an RV on something called the joyful vampire tour of America, releasing the movie. You had a dream. Literally, you you literally physically had a dream dream that that was happening. And I called, (laughs) and I called Sarah the next morning and I was like, this might be crazy, but what if we just rented an RV and did the joyful vampire tour of America and God bless her. She was like, yes. And we should put fangs on it. Um, (laughs) that's awesome. You see, this is the audacity I was talking about. This is what I love about this story. (laughs) So in this last December, we, I had this dream and we basically started calling everybody that we knew within the industry and and sounding out this idea. Um, oh, and oh, that didn't go well, I'm sure. <laughs> it had, you know, the, the nothing will signal how giant a crisis the industry is in as basically everybody's response was, well, nothing else is working. You may as well try wow. it. Wow. Wow. That's that says volumes. Right. One one woman read us the riot act about how we were throwing our careers <laughs> off the cliff, but um, <laughs> truly. It took a while for that phone call. And when it finally happened, I was like, oh, this is finally happening. (laughs) Okay. Okay, good. We Uh, we are crazy. I mean, can't everyone can't agree with this. This is insane. But everybody else was just like, we don't know, probably try it. Um so I guess so we decided around Christmas that we were gonna do this. And then we had from January to May to to put together the tour. Um and, and the basic thinking behind the tour was okay. If the hurdle is that it's really hard to get people to leave their houses now to watch a movie because you have infinite content from your sofa, then you have to offer people an extra reason to do it. Yes. Um, so we thought a piece of that is certainly having the filmmaker be there, being able to do a Q&A after people meet the filmmaker, get to talk about the movie. But we felt like there needed to be another element that that wasn't quite enough um, so we, we came up with the idea that we would throw a joyful vampire ball after every screening, um, <laughs> Excellent. and that we would invite the audience to come dressed in costume to the screening and the bar and the party. And, so, and if I may stop you for a second, and if you understand your niche, which you guys definitely do understand your niche, that audience would love to dress up and go oh, to yeah. a ball. Oh yes. Right. And, and, and funnily enough, the, the, the desire to dress in costume and wound up expanding way beyond our niche audience. Like it turns out that most 
adults just looking for an excuse to wear a costume. Fun fact. Fun fact for everyone listening out there. Yeah. <laughs> People just want to dress up. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was the concept. And then we, we ran some back of the napkin math and quickly understood that we could not physically make back anything close to the budget from the tour itself because I, I had three months that I could do physically go on this tour. So we had, we had, we had to do a three month tour and, and okay, you can't do a screening every night or you'll die. So maybe like initially we thought we'd do like 20 to 30 screenings over the, that time count the seats. The most you can make is like $40,000. Um, so just from, but that's just from ticket sales. That doesn't tickets. include other yes. streams of revenue. Exactly. So we, so we decided quickly that the model that we were going to test was to use the tour to drive online sales. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got the film, uh, transactionally on iTunes, Amazon, and Google play. And, um, and then we, we did a partnership with seed and spark so that they would help us market the tour. Mm -hmm. And so the film was available for subscription on demand through seed and spark. Um, which was worth it to us because if you're, if they're your only subscription platform, they pay 40 cents per minute watched of your movie. Oh, that's amazing. Which is bananas, which means that it, you make more money if somebody watches it on seed and spark than even if they buy a ticket. Wow. I wonder how that business, I have to call Emily. What's that business sure. model working? Like how I are mean, you doing? I, I think the, the only explanation I can come up with is, is that they're artificially inflating it at the beginning of the, of their model to try to attract filmmakers. And then eventually that will go down, but like Amazon did. Yeah. But I'm, like Amazon I'm did. happy to reap the benefits in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, and then what are the other revenue streams that you were able to create on this tour? Uh, so, um, merchandise, merchandise was the, the major one. So we, and because of the nature of the film, we we felt like, we we just had a merchandise sort of extravaganza. Of course, waiting for us. So we but, had. but also don't forget, and I hate to interrupt you again, but that this audience is known for purchasing stuff yeah. like yeah. Comic Con geeks, yeah. mega nerds. Okay. This is what they love to do. Right. So they love to dress up, and yeah. they love to buy stuff. Love to buy stuff. Great audience. Great yeah. audience to yeah. go to Target. So I'm just trying. I'm stopping you every once in a while, so yeah, everyone yeah. hears and understands what the mentality and the process is because you guys are doing, you're basically hitting every note. So far as a film entrepreneur, you're hitting every note so far, so far you're hitting every note. Okay. Um, so we had uh, DVDs and Blu-rays print made up. We had posters. We had, um, very nice ena enamel pins. We had two kinds of t-shirts, uh, one that was the film's and one, we had a very funny love sucks, um, design, uh, design. So, okay. And I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop Please. there. I'll, I'll stop yep. there one more time. Is that now you understand your niche audience and you're creating not only merchandise off your movie, but you're also creating merchandise that that audience would like that is kind of related to your movie, but not directly related. So like the love sucks right. t-shirt is just something that people who like vampires would probably buy. Right. And, yes. And that design one of the characters wears that t-shirt in the movie, but oh, that's so, but that's, but then you see again, yeah. now you're product right. placing yeah, yeah, yeah. your movie. Oh, oh my God. Guys. You're yeah. like, <laughs> you're so hitting all the dots. Oh my God. I love this. I'm so glad I have you on the show. All right. Conti <laughs> so continue. Um, okay. So we had hoodies. Um, we had mugs. We had three different designs of mugs mm -hmm. and I think that's it. And then you sold every at every event. You would yeah. sell merch. And did how much revenue did you generate from all the merch through the whole tour, give or take? Um, I Gross. believe nine nine thousand dollars. Okay, so that's a nice. Hey, yeah. I'll take I'll take it if it's on the floor. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's yep. a nice it's it's a nice it's a nice chunk of change. Why not? Yeah. Uh, okay, great. So now, uh, and then, what other revenue sources did you create? Uh, well, the ball. How did that process work? So the balls, we ended up deciding. Um, okay. So, so the way it ended up working with venues and the balls is some venues, the screening and the ball would be at the same venue. Mm -hmm. So the whole evening would take place. And, and generally there, there was only one ticket price and it was for the whole thing. And those tickets tended to be more expensive. Right. Um, 
some theaters were, or some venues were more traditional theaters and they, they either didn't have the space or wouldn't let us do the ball at that venue. So in those cases, we would have the screening and then move everybody to a dip who, who wanted to come to a separate venue, usually like a local bar or something for the ball. Okay. Um, and in those places, generally we didn't charge extra for the ball. We ended up deciding that it, it was more worth it to have the people come and meet us and be engaged and buy merchandise. Like the longer they hang out, the drunker they get, the more merchandise they're going to buy. So that's a plus. We, we just didn't feel, and, and particularly because in those situations, we would be doing them often at bars where other people were present. It became kind of complicated to be able to, it didn't feel like something we could really charge for. If I did this again, when I do this again, mm-hmm. um, I would, I would always do it in venues where I could do the whole evening in one place. It, it didn't oh, really yeah. work very well when you had to move people. And then I would charge more for the whole experience. So, so quite often at these events, my, so my husband was always working the merchandise, my, my very, very nice husband who moved into an RV for three months to test a distribution model would always work the merch table. And quite often people would come up to him and give him cash donations towards the film as they left the theater, nice. um, which was really interesting. I mean, totally unsolicited. Obviously we weren't asking for donations. Um, but what that signaled to us is that people consistently felt like they had gotten more value than they had paid for. Um, so that they would have paid more money for the experience that they got. What was the cost? What was the cost for the, the for the ball and the ticket? For the so movie? a lot of, a lot of places we were hamstrung by, by what the movie theater normally charged for movies. Um, so some places it was like seven or $8. Um, whenever we could control it, it we charged usually 20 for the movie plus the ball. Oh, that's um, so cheap though. I mean, you're kidding. Right. That's so cheap. Right. You could have easily right. charged 50, we 60, 70 more. bucks easily. Yeah. We wanted to test it and, yeah. and see, I think, I think, uh, in the future I would, I would charge more. Yeah, because you're creating um, a, an experience. You're creating an event. Like even a even if you go to a a bar, sometimes the cover is going to be twenty bucks. Sure. Like you know, yeah. there's there's ways of yeah. you could have. I we we definitely lowballed it with with the feeling that we were really testing a model, and we needed to like it was something that people weren't going to be used to attending. It wasn't really a concept that audiences were going to understand. So we had to kind of like make the bar for entry pretty low. Got it. Got it. All right. So, so when, when it's all said and done, what were the, the rough numbers coming in from the tour? So from ticket sales, um, I think it came in at about 17,000. Okay. Okay. So and, that 17, includes, and that includes, and that includes balls. Yeah. Okay. So about 17,000 from ticket sales, which we could have, I think had we sold out every venue, we would have made about 40,000, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were marketing 51 screenings in 90 days with a very small team. Um, sure. so, and then, yeah, that was my next question. How did you actually put asses in seats? Like, what, what, cause that's a lot of marketing. That's a lot of, right. Yes. So, um, we, 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 we tried everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did, we did a lot of paid Facebook ads, both to drive online sales and then also to drive people to screenings. Mm-hmm. So we would target people in a specific geographic area, drive into screening. And the geographic targeting ads worked shockingly well. I thought those wouldn't work at all. But consistently at screenings, people came because they saw an ad on Facebook. One lady drove four hours to see it in costume because she saw an ad on Facebook which I find shocking. Well, oddly, because there's not a lot of places you can dress up as a vampire, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and without being sconed at, uh, you know, scoffed yeah. at and, and go there. So it, it, you, you really, I think you, you, you left some money on the table. If, if mm, I may. It, yeah, yeah, no, we, we did. But, but the other thing is we went, we went in blind. Like yeah. we had no information right. because there's no information. So there are a hundred things I would do differently next time. And, and part of the reason we were doing the docuseries is so that now other people can have our information and do better mm-hmm. with next time. Um, so uh, we did the paid Facebook ads in almost every place. We had a local host 
whose job was to help hustle their friends, um, help hang posters around town. A street team, a street team, a street team. Yes. Got it. Um, so they, they were crucial. Like I would say that was probably the most effective, uh, means of getting people into seats. Um, and, oh, actually, so we, 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 with Seed and Spark, we ran surveys about this. So we, we would have people sign up via text for our email list in the theater after the screening, which everybody should do. This is, this worked incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the first email they would get would have a survey asking them to tell us like why they had come to the film and where they'd heard about it on all this stuff. And so the top, the top reason by far was hearing about it from a friend who was not involved in the film. So either word of mouth or local host. Um, and then the next three tied reasons were paid Facebook ads, um, uh, hearing about somebody it from a friend who was involved in the film and uh, hearing about it from the venue. Interesting. And okay. then everything else, like there was, there was hardly anything else that even rate ranked on that scale. I mean, we did a lot of other stuff. So we, um, we did have physical posters hung most all around theaters. most of the town, not, not just at the theaters, but like around the communities. Um, yeah. We, we did, we had a lot of, we had a very active social media life, even outside of the paid ads, which was effective. We, um, we did Facebook event pages, which I do think were quite effective. We, um, we targeted local grassroots organ. We, we used grassroots methods to target local organizations. So anything involving women in film, we would reach out to them, anything and any, really any local film groups we would reach out to, um, any local vampire clubs, any local D and D clubs, um, any LARPing groups, any Harry Potter clubs. There are a shocking number of Harry Potter clubs around the country. We'd reach out to them. Um, did you think, uh, did you do any conventions? Con like, did you show it up at any conventions? We did. We were invited to play at Spike Con in oh, nice. Utah, which we did, which was awesome. Uh -huh. Um, I think do playing more cons is going to be part of the next leg of our strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, but we only played one on the tour itself. Okay. So, all right. So, and then when, so you obviously were thinking about developing ancillary products during the movie, obviously, because you had people wearing t-shirts and you're already thinking about ancillary products. So that was part of your strategy as well. Like we're going to sell merch. We're going to sell some merch on this. Like it, this yeah. is before the tour, you were thinking of selling merch. Yeah. I think that was always in our minds. Okay. Um, although again, we, we thought we would go down a more traditional path. Like I think we were thinking we were helping set up a distributor to do a good job and then. Right. Huh. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I come the, yeah, yeah. for people who are listening, you just see my face like a distributor did like, like and my <laughs> face said everything. I was like, yeah, right. You know, like setting yeah. a, that's such a, that's such an indie filmmaker thing to say. We all yeah. do. It's like, I'm going to set them up properly to do a good yeah, job. Yeah. Like they don't care. No. Uh, <laughs> So now that you've done this this uh, this tour, yeah, that you were trying to drive digital sales, did it drive digital sales, and do you have any sort of numbers with that? <laughs> well, so here is the giant problem with these digital platforms: is they don't tell you for three to six months. They don't give you any numbers for three to six months. So unlike any other normal marketing thing, I mean, like with with selling tickets on the road, we were able to to very much adjust our tactics as we went, mm -hmm. as we learned and saw what was happening every night. And you just don't know. Um, so that is a huge problem. So we will definitely make those numbers public once we have them, but we don't have them yet. And then what's the, you were talking a little earlier about the next leg. What are you mm -hmm. doing? How are you continuing this audacity of a journey? <laughs> um, well, so the tour ended uh, two weeks ago. Oh, wow. And we've all been in a bit of a coma. We all, all gave ourselves permission to be in a coma more or less since then. So we don't have an exact plan yet. We're going to start putting that together next month. Um, but some things that we're definitely going to do, uh, start getting on the con circuit more aggressively. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we have somebody who's helping us with foreign, uh, sales. We've, we've had a okay, lot good. of interest from international territories for the film. So how, um, so how are you processing that? Are you doing that through a sales agent or are you going to a, a, an international distributor? Well, I don't know yet. So we have, um, we have an Australian sales agent who I met, um, through a friend and 
is is like a ver- an actually trustworthy human being, <laughs> mm-hmm. unlike most sales agents. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she has very g- generously offered to help us sort of like suss out what the best way to go is. She wanted to wait till the end of the tour so that we had our materials. So one of one of the big advantages to the tour outside just the the revenue we earned from the tour is that um, we now have video testimonials <laughs> of people in costumes all over the country talking about how much they love the film, how their favorite film. You know, it's like so we have our our documentary filmmaker who was with us making the docu series is putting together a sizzle reel for us that we can now send with our trailer to distributors. We're going to go, holy shit! They ended up getting like they got people to come out in costume to watch this movie. But and you're, but you're in the distributors with international. I'm assuming you're not going to get rid of. You're not going to give them domestic. No, no, not domestic. Internationally. Internationally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you're just going to try to go territory. Are you going to go to AFM or anything like that and see if you can do anything? I think we might try to go to AFM. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you're there, we'll, then, we'll have coffee. I'll be there. Okay. No, I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> um, have you ever been? Yeah. I've never been though. No. Oh, prepare yourself. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it is, it's an interesting place. Let's just put yeah. it that way. I went one year and yeah. the biggest movie of the year was Steven Seagal versus Mike Tyson, uh, in a movie. And then of course you need to watch that movie cause I want to know who yes. wins, but yeah. that's the kind of, uh, place it yeah, is. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a unique, it's a unique, unique place. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of soul crushing. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, I think eventually we will try to, to, to make a deal with one of the streaming platforms. I think the feedback we've been getting is that the, the good thing about the streaming platforms at this particular moment is that there are all these new ones coming to the market in the next six months. Um, and, and they're so, all looking and they're all looking. And they're all looking. So it's a, it is actually a little bit more of, of a, a seller's marketplace right now than it has been with the streaming platforms. Okay. And I'm assuming you try to, did you submit to Netflix and Hulu yet or not yet? I am. Not yet. Okay. Um, all right. I, I mean, it's, you guys have, I mean, you're, you're, you are hustlers. You are indie film hustlers. Yeah, you're, sure. <laughs> you're film entrepreneurs. You are hustling it. You're keeping going. Yeah. You see, most filmmakers would have just said, well, that was the end of the tour. We're done. But you're like, no, no, no. As we continue this journey. Um, yeah. and, and well, we this, haven't made the money back yet. And, and I think like, Part of this experiment to me is to try to figure out, like, is there a market, like, is it possible to make back half a million dollars money on indie films right now? Mm-hmm. And the answer may be no. And if the answer is no, because so to, to talk, speak about digital sales for a second, I, we don't have the final numbers, but I have a niggling feeling that we may have reached a moment where people are simply unwilling to pay even two ninety nine for oh, yeah. a movie. Mm-hmm. Oh um, no, the the, and, the the future is is AVOD. Is right. is it's that's the future. I mean, I know filmmakers making a ton more on AVOD than they are on SVOD or TVOD. Right. Without question. Yes. So that oh right. Also airlines. We're gonna try to make some airline deals. Airlines, yeah. cruise lines. Um, yep. the, the church is not so much with the vampire movie, but, uh, <laughs> not play very well unless the churches. they're vampire churches, unless it's vampire churches. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, I now suspect that our revenue model was wrong. I bet that, that the tour will not have driven transactional sales in the way that we needed it to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and so, uh, but I think we have to look really into the abyss here as filmmakers and say like, is it possible at any budget level? If it isn't, what does that mean? And and maybe the answer is that like you just have to make very micro budget films or the answer is that like a lot of the arts that the goal isn't actually to make money, it's to make impact and um, that that ceases to be the goal. Um, as long as the budget then, justify you justify as long as the bu- budget. But then, well, as long as you are completely upfront about that with your investors, invest- if everyone understands that, like, look, we're making right. art here, and this is an art ex- exhibition, and we're going to put it out there, yeah. and this is the way it is. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I'm I'm in the, I'm in the in the trenches here every day yeah. uh, in the indie yeah. film trenches. So yeah. 
The answer is yes, you can make your money back, but you, and that's what the whole film entrepreneur model is about. It's about rethinking how right. you do it. Could this movie, if you would have made this movie for a hundred thousand dollars, which is, it's a, it's still a, a decent budget, a hundred thousand dollars. It you would be very close to making your money back sure. more unlikely, you know? So it's about always about the budget and keeping that overhead right. low or, or whatever, there's always that balance of like, you know, if I spend a million bucks, well, what do I need to do to get that million bucks back mm-hmm. and, and vice right. versa? So right. if, if this, for argue, argument's sake, if this movie would have cost $50,000, uh, the tour would have been great, right. right? The tour would have been great. Well, except, yeah. Give or take. I mean, you're not going to make all the money Give back on the yeah, tour, yeah, yeah. but you would be really yeah. close, you know, and even on just merch sales, you would have done pretty yeah. well. I mean, obviously costs and stuff like that, but yeah. Right. So, but I have to say that, and obviously the money is important, obviously. However, there, there is another bottom line here, which is impact. And I have never felt as an artist, like my work was having greater impact than on this tour ever. It was astonishing Mm -hmm. to travel the country and go to Vicksburg, Mississippi and Wichita, Kansas, and like these places that I have never been Mm -hmm. and show my movie and talk to people afterwards. Um, many of whom had never met a filmmaker before. Like I feel like in New York and Los Angeles, we forget actually what a big deal that is. Cause if you can find a screening without a filmmaker in attendance, it's like amazing. Uh, but, but like in Vicksburg, they had never met a filmmaker before for like for them, for them, it was like, I may as well have been Steven Spielberg, you know? And, and I had this one really fascinating dialogue with a woman um, in Columbus, Ohio, who the, my film lovingly pokes fun at Christians, but this woman what, what took great affront to that and came barreling up to me afterwards and um, was, was very hurt um, about the fact that I'd made fun of Christians. And I, and I, said, you know, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And we had this whole, we had a really extended conversation about the the concept of comedy and punching up versus punching down and sort of like, and at the end of it, she was like, well, it felt really great to be able to say that to a filmmaker because normally nobody hears my responses to movies. And I was like, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and, and the idea, my hope, my dream now (laughs) is that if we could get like an Oregon trail of filmmakers doing these tours and bringing film independent films to parts of the country that do not see independent film that have no access to anything in an in-person setting other than the Avengers. And, and they could meet and have these dialogues with filmmakers of all different backgrounds and perspectives that would change the country. It would. It would. And I, I would, I would agree with you on that. And I think that the, the future of independent film, there's going to be a, you're going to need to do a lot more work. So yeah. I think that's going to that's going to um thin out the herd if you will mm-hmm. because there's not many filmmakers that I know who want to get into an RV for 3 months <laughs> put some fangs on it and and travel the country. There yeah. just isn't. And it's going to that's what it's going to take. It's going to take yeah. thinking about movies differently. It's going to think about how can I create other revenue streams from this film? Is the film a loss leader where I I made the film for 100 grand but I'm really making money on these online courses or books or, you know, depending on the subject matter, you know, all the, all this kind of stuff. It's about thinking about it differently. I do believe there's a space for us, but I think we're going to turn into more carnies where I think that you've got to provide a service that the studios can't. Exactly. Period. And what you were able to do the studio, there's no Avengers ball. No. Now they also made two point some billion dollars. So they don't care. Because that's not what, that's not what their business model is. But for us, the scrappy independent filmmaker, the film entrepreneur, we got to figure out other ways to make it happen. And I, I always look at this whole process as the creative process. The movie is just one part of this entire, from casting to creating product lines, to doing this tour. This is all creative, uh, yeah. And oh, has, absolutely. And has to become and, part of the dialogue and has to become part of this process yeah. because you and, can't just drop off to a distributor. Like as no. we very, no. very, uh, very, very much very have clearly, said, clearly have said out. in this, in this episode. Right. And so many filmmakers, both 
before the tour and during the tour was like, well, I think it's really awesome what you're doing, but like, I would never want to do all that work. And like, well then, but, but to me, and which I have sympathy for on the one hand, but on the other hand, a, why are we making movies if no one's going to see them? And B, um, I I'm with you. Like I found, I loved being on the tour, like getting, I'm a filmmaker getting to show my film to people 51 times and listen to them laugh and have them come and cut. Like it was the greatest. I mean, I, I put, I, it's one of the greatest periods of my life. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I have, you know, you're not the first film to ever go on a road show. There's many have done it before, but, and there's many that will do it after it's creating a business model that can sustain the art. Cause yeah. you know, as, as I say, the word show and there's the word business and the word business has twice as many letters as the word show. And there's a reason for that because yeah. without the business, there is no show and yeah. as much impact as you want to make, wouldn't it be better to make a film that oh, of course. you can not only make your money back, but everyone gets paid. You get a little bit of profit and you could do it again and again yep. and again Absolutely. and again. And if you control and I- everything yeah. and you create your own portfolio, where you have actual revenue streams and not like, maybe you'll get a report. <laughs> right. That's, that's the future. Right. That's the future. Absolutely. And I think the, the key pathway to that future is more films being willing to offer themselves as case study, as radically transparent case studies, because a filmmaker within their lifetime is not going to make enough films to crack the model the based on their own experimentation. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be honest with each other, even when we fail, even like we just have to, because then we will figure it out. Cause there, I believe I'm with you. I believe there is a model out there, but we don't know what it is right now. <laughs> That's for damn sure. I mean, the model that has worked for me is doing ultra micro budget movies yeah. that have a good production value that are aimed at a niche audience. And then, and you control everything. And you know, my first film cost me five grand to make. And I sold it to Hulu and I sold it internationally and I, I, I drove sales, but I have a platform and I was yeah. able to, to build off that. And there's audience building and there's that whole conversation yeah, we never yeah. even got into, but that, that is a possibility. If I would have made that movie for 50 or a hundred grand, I don't know, probably, right. probably would have been another statistic. So right. it's, it's a weird balance. This is a weird, it's a wonderful and an extremely dangerous time for being an independent filmmaker because- Definitely. There's more access than ever before, but the competition is just, it's crushing. It really well, I would is. Well, I would say the noise more than the competition. Yeah. Like it's, it yeah. w- I feel like I, it would feel differently if, if you were, if it was just like, like such great work was being made and you were like up against like, and you were, and you were losing out to films that like blew your mind and that doesn't feel but like, uh, but the, sometimes you see those films, but I, it's just, it's sort of the noise. But, the, but also uh, with that said, the competition is not just films. It's amazing no, television. No. Oh, I yeah. mean, the television that's coming out right now, it's where all a lot of independent filmmakers are going sure. because I mean, and you're competing for that hour, Oh yeah. you know, you know, you're going to oh, watch and phones and video games, social and media and a million everything. other, th- a million other things. So there's just a lot of competition for yeah. eyeballs. It's, yeah. it's a, I'm but curious. What, but what's interesting again about that. So, so my hypothesis going into the tour was that you could maybe salvage the in-person experience as long as you relied on, on online viewing for money. And I actually think it's the reverse because the number of people that came up to me and said, like, this is the first meaningful human interaction I've had with strangers in months. And like, the hunger of people to, it, it is harder to get them out of their houses for sure. But once they're there, you can give them like borderline religious experiences with very little like, effort, you know, just but in but the simple act of putting them in a room and giving them context to interact with other people. Yeah, it's it it, it is the future. It is the future. I think this is a this is a model that can work. I think at a certain budget range. Uh it could work without question. I think at this budget range, it will work, but it's gonna take longer. It's going to be harder yeah. hustling. And, and it's an experiment. You guys are really, and your investors must be really cool people. They're really cool people. <laughs> They're extremely cool and, people. And we did ask them, like we, we explained, but, but the other thing is like, okay, so I think you're right. I think there's money that we probably left on the table. How, are we whole? No, but are we better off than if we had gotten a distribution deal? Yes. You bet we are. You have money. 
We have, have money. S- so, <laughs> we something. Have actual money. You actually got some we, money. We made more in, in the first week of ticket sales from the tour than I made for my entire first feature film from a distributor. Correct. Done. So, yeah. Right. I mean, that pretty much says everything you need to say. So as a, as a, as a business person, as you know, you have to look at like, okay, well, what cost does that potential revenue justify? And that's, that's the, it's like, it's like, you got to look at it as developing any widget, keep the cost as low as possible Mm -hmm. by still maintaining as high quality as possible to be able to create a marketable product, you know, and then also art, you know, there's that, it's a weird, we're a very unique, strange business. You know, yeah. we're the only, we're the only business that says we're going to invest a million dollars into something that we kind of maybe figure, maybe there'll be some way we'll make our money back. Like right. it's, and, and has no inherent value that that's value will be decided upon I mean, fi- financially upon completion. Right. Cause this has a value. some random pe- people. Right. right. This, this has a value. Yeah. This, this phone has a value and, and it costs X amount and it has this X amount of value attached to it. A movie, I mean, The Room, you know, the movie The Room, which is considered one of the worst movies of all time, has a specific value attached to it. Right. Is it better produced than your film? No. Is it better produced than most films? No. But- Is it more profitable? Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Tommy Wiseau is a millionaire off of this right. movie because of the perceived value of that film. Right. So it's such a crazy- Thing. Well, what, right, which is crazy as a business, and it's also the only art form that is expected to make money. Like no other art form is, is really you're right is expected to make money. Right, exactly, but because the the value the cost is so high, the right. cost is so high to create our art, you know. And there's so many, and it's a collaborative art, so it's not even one person; it's a collaborative art. So now you've got to you know. deal with all of that and the politics and the personalities. What are we doing? Well, this Why? is what I have. <laughs> I, I, I actually I came up with I came up with a, 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 a basically an idea of what why we are as insane as we are, and you are literally a carny. I mean, you literally went on the road and put up a tent and put a show on and packed it up and moved it to the next town. Yeah. So, I mean, I always consider us of carnies, but I think. Um, we have to get ourselves checked out for celluloid because we might have a bad case of filmmaking. And I think, <laughs> and, and, it, and I think once we get bitten, there's no vaccine. I like know. you're done, you're done. You're, I you're, know. it's over. And, 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 and to be a little bit more crass, it's kind of like herpes because it, it, it's dormant a lot of times, but it flares up and it's with you yeah. for life. <laughs> <laughs> so, True. Well, I'm like, even in, even in the worst day on tour, I would go into that theater and listen to an audience full of people laughing at the jokes I had written. And I was like, I'm good. I'm done. Like, I have to do I'm this good. for the rest of my life. There's nothing else I can do. Don't even need money. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. it's, we're insane. We're insane. Yeah. But if we understand our insanity and we, if, we under, if we are self-aware enough of what we're doing, because a lot of filmmakers are not. A lot of <laughs> filmmakers are delusional. Trust me, I know. Uh, I was very delusional for many for many years of my career. I'm sure you might have had a few years yeah. of delusion yeah. as well. Uh, but if we're self aware enough, and then we actually become smart about how we can actually create our art and make a business out of our art, and then create other revenue se- streams to re- to support us while we're making our art to the point where we are able to eventually do this full time, that's the dream. And I think also a lot of filmmakers have this whole. I need to make a million dollars and I have to work in the studio system and I have to do all, like that dream that Hollywood's been selling us since yeah. the 90s. If I'm able to make money that pays my rent and puts food on my table for my family and I'm able to provide a service which is entertainment or some other service that I'm providing my audience, isn't that the dream? Like For me it is, yeah. Right, it's like I don't need billions of dollars. You know, I, I don't, I'm happy. Right, but now. I do need to be able to pay my rent. And I think that's the. And pay your we're, people. We're still pay, not quite there. Yeah. Right. Pay your rent, pay your people that work with you on this, and the yep. crazy people that you con into doing, right. <laughs> <laughs> going on these crazy journeys with us as filmmakers. Yeah. But I mean, I do, I do think there's something to the Duplass yes. model for sure of, of very low, keeping the cost low up front by giving everybody a piece of the back end yep. with the touring model because one thing so I, I will say that that having the name actors did help to a certain extent, but Naomi Grossman, who is one of them, hustled her took us off for us. And and like 
got every cousin she has to come out to a screening and got every person she knows in every city. And she put more butts in seats, not because she's famous, but because she like hounded people to come. And for that reason, she was the most valuable actor. And I think actually, if you, if you had a whole team of filmmakers actively hounding people in cities because they were going to get a piece of the back end, we would have sold more tickets than we sold because we had famous actors. Yeah, there's 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 multiple different business models. And I think the yeah. Duplass brothers have been able to – they cracked the code. I mean the Duplass has cracked the code a while ago. And, and if you remember their first films, they were made for nothing. Right. And you know I the mean whole, they're also friends with famous people, which again like But that, now. But now. Right now. Yeah, not yeah. when they were starting out. Right. When they were start when they did Puffy Chair, you know, they had they had Sundance because they got the short film the year before, but it took right. them a minute before those famous people friends. Yeah, yeah. And right. now they can leverage everything that they have. But you know the whole Marvel story with them, right? Have you heard that story? Mm-mm. Marvel called the Duplasses and they offered them a movie and they turned it down because they said, it's just not us. And that is self-awareness. And that yeah. is a clear understanding of what is important to you as a filmmaker. They said, look, we would be locked up for three years and it would have been fun maybe, but it's that it's kind of like we don't want to do that. Like we want to make right. other films. We want to employ our friends. We want to go out and do the, tell the stories we want to tell. Like why would right. we lock ourselves up for right. this kind of film? Like we're good. You know, we're making Netflix yeah. movies. We're making Netflix shows. We're doing HBO shows. Right. Like I'm good. Yeah, yeah. I don't right. need that. And right. that – and every filmmaker that hears the story, many of them are like, you're crazy. I'm like, I said, no, he knows. And they both know right. exactly what's important to them. Right. And I think that's where yeah. we all have to be. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my okay. entrepreneur guests, what advice would you give a film entrepreneur starting a project today? I- Liberate yourselves from the system. The Matrix. Get unplugged yeah, get out from of the, the Matrix. Unplugged from yeah, the Matrix. Keep the red pill, because <laughs> be, from the beginning. Because the other thing that I like, if we had known from day one of making Bite Me that this is what we we're going to do, a we would have done things differently, and we would have been able to set ourselves up so much more successfully. Very good. Now, what is the biggest lesson you've learned going through this? audacity of, of this, this tour, this project where you are, what's the biggest lesson you've learned so far? The system is a lie. (laughs) The matrix is a lie. Why? It's true. Like, I mean, I just can't tell you how many things people said to us, like, well, you're never going to get theaters to agree to this. Well, they will. So many theaters said yes, that we had to cap the tour at 51 screenings. Like that was not the, like, they're just, the idea that film festivals are the be all end all. No. When when in reality they're eating up your profits <laughs> realistically. Right. Of course. Um, it's a lie. And so like think differently. Think differently. Okay, perfect. Yes, like Apple says, think different. Uh, back in the day. Now, what is uh what did you learn? What have you learned from your biggest uh filmmaking or business failure? Like that first movie. <laughs> Besides, don't don't sign with the traditional distributor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. I mean, I feel like it's the same answer again. Just don't. Just just it's, like, it's, well, that that the decision to set to give your film to a distributor is the last decision you get to make with that film, basically. Wow. Whereas that's great. Whereas whatever mistakes or successes we had with this tour, we now get to make an infinite number of decisions next. Do you see, do you see yourselves partnering strategically with a traditional distributor, like carving out certain rights, like actually doing a real partnership if you found good distributors? Um, because I have, yeah. and I have, I've, I, you yeah, know, sure. it, like if but, there's, but it's so hard to know. I mean, this is the problem. Like they all sound great up front and mm-hmm. then, But yeah, I mean, of course, like if, if the right opportunity came along, I think particularly internationally, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it, I mean, it all yes, it, it, it just all depends. It all depends because there yeah. are there are models out there. There are distribution companies that I work with that can do good stuff. But I I would agree. Like if you just sign everything over, if you can try to, you know, like I'm going to keep the DVD rights. I have the rights to sell it on my website. Something right. that's something. a huge thing. Like it, yeah. if if all hell breaks loose, I can still sell it on my I might I could sell it on my yeah. website. I could put it on yeah. Vimeo Plus and, and sell it. Right, right. If, if worse comes to worse. Um, now, um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? The system is a lie. No. <laughs> okay. It's so, so basically- hard because you grow up watching the Oscars and you like, and then everybody talks about Sundance and it's like, there's, it's so, it feels magical. So true. And it just isn't. And it, and like, and it's so hard. I feel like I've had to learn that lesson over and over and over again. Okay. Now, in your opinion, what is the definition of a film entrepreneur? I think a filmmaker who understands that their job does not end when the picture is locked. That's a great definition. It's a great definition. I love that. Now, where can people find out more about you, about Bite Me, about everything you're doing? Well, <laughs> uh, I have a website. <laughs> <laughs> what? Shocking. It's 2019. Uh, <laughs> Naomi McDougall Jones.com. It's not GeoCities? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, it on, uh, is it on AOL? No, I'm joking. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. How does that AOL work? Exactly. Exactly. Um, BiteMeTheFilm.com is our, our film's website. Um, I would very much encourage people to watch our docu-series, which is mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, you just search for the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. Um, it's 12 episodes. It's, uh, it was made by Kiwi Callahan. It's incredibly funny and fun, just as like an adventure story of us living in an RV for three months traveling around the country, but also does, we pull our pants all the way down and everything. So um, if, if I had had that tool as a filmmaker, Six months ago, my life would be different. Wow. That's awesome. Naomi, it has been an absolute pleasure talking yes, to you. I'm so Thank glad we were able to me. finally get together and make yes, this I'm happen. <laughs> and I hope, and I do hope that this episode really educates some people out there and really inspires some people to do something and also terrify some people because it ain't easy out here. Mm -mm. It, it isn't easy. And like you said, the filmmaker who understands that their job is not done at cut, final cut is a really great definition of a film entrepreneur because you've got to think about other things and you've got to look at things differently as you so wonderfully put. So thank you again so much for being so candid and dropping some knowledge bombs and inspirational bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much for having me. That was an epic interview. Naomi, thank you again so much for not only being on the show, but for everything you're doing for filmmakers with that amazing series, which by the way, the series is available on Indie Film Hustle TV. So anybody who has membership to Indie Film Hustle TV, you can watch the entire series there as part of your membership. Uh, it's also available on YouTube as well, but I will put links to all of that in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 342. I'll also put links to uh, the movie and where to buy it, rent it, see it, and support this amazing group of filmmakers who are trying to make it happen for not only themselves, but to help the community as well. And I'm always behind anybody, any filmmaker who is willing to be so open-minded and completely transparent about their process of trying to make money in this insane business. So thanks again, Naomi, for coming on the show. Now, if you haven't already, and if you really like the show, it really mean a lot to me if you head over to filmmakingpodcast.com. It'll take you straight to Apple Podcasts. Subscribe, leave a review. It really helps the show out a lot. It really, really, really appreciate it. And I have a little bit of update on that book, The Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. It is about a week away from me delivering it to my editor and getting everything ready for our October release. So I will keep you up to date on that. All I'm going to tell you guys is this. This book is going to blow the lid off this business. <laughs> I mean, I go buck wild on the business in this book. I really, really do. It is 
a eye-opening book that tells a lot of truth bombs and a lot of hard realities about this business, but also gives you a blueprint on how you can actually make a business out of your filmmaking, out of your films, and to be able to build an actual business around what you love to do. So if you want to, again, pre-order that book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com, which will take you straight to Amazon where you could pre-order the book to be the first to get it. Thank you again so much. This has been a crossover edition with the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. Of course, if you haven't gone to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, please head over to filmbizpodcast.com. That's filmbizpodcast.com. That takes you to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. It is growing very, very fast, and it's getting a lot of great reviews. A lot of uh, tribe members are heading over there. It's a lot of great, great information. New episode every single week. So thanks again for listening, guys, and as always... Keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. Say Metro by T-Mobile. Got the best deal in wireless. And it's all for you. All for me. Just switch quickly. Because Metro has two lines for 80. And two Samsung Galaxy J7 Star phones for free. Plus Amazon Prime included. That's the way wireless should be. Only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. $50 plus rate plan required. Not valid for numbers currently on T-Mobile Network or on Metro in past 90 days. Offer subject to change. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Amazon Prime has a $12.99 per month value. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions.